mothers did throw them in the trash can, made mine all that more valuable. And he had 52 Mickey Mantle cards. In today's episode, things get complicated. Either Mike is out of his mind or the seller is being emotional about his cards and he can't seem to let go. In the end, things take quite the twist. I'm not really prepared to do that. The history of sports cards goes back over 100 years. We are on the pursuit to find the biggest and most interesting sports card collections across the United States. Join us as we travel the large interstates and the narrow unpaved roads in our journey to continue chasing cardboard. Today we are going to see a gentleman by the name of Ricky. He came to us via a friend. You know, it's really important that if you're looking for opportunities to buy cards, the larger your hobby network is, the better. You're just gonna have more opportunities. It's that simple. From what the pictures that I saw, some really cool vintage, some really cool vintage autographs, which I'm super excited to see. And I think he's got some great story. Yeah, this should be a fun day. Mike, how's it going? Hey, Ricky. Good to see you. Oh, good to meet you. Good to meet you, too. Yeah. This is pretty terrific stuff. How did you come across this stuff? How did you get it? I was 10 years old. So this is stuff you bought I, as a kid. I, I kept it. I was one of the few that their mothers didn't throw all that in the trash can. Love it. When those let mothers did throw them in the trash can, made mine all that more valuable. So you just kept everything? Did you buy packs and stuff when you were a kid? Uh, yeah, I mean, these these all came with a stick of gum. Okay. You know, I had the gum and the card. And... So when we look at cards, especially when it's from someone who literally pulled them out of the packs, it is so great to hear that experience. Obviously, I wasn't able to pull vintage cards when I was a kid, but to have someone that they're, they've been their cards for 50, 60 years, it's just very, very neat. When I was living in Cuba, at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, there was a guy there that uh, had two, two sons, and I guess he was associated with Tops or something at one time, and he had 52 Mickey Mantle cards. Now, I don't know if it was rookie cards or not, because this was in 62, but they had okay. 52 of them. Wow. And no matter what I did, they, wouldn't, they weren't willing to let go of anything, <laughs> and they were so greedy with these cards that they didn't want the brother to get their cards, so both of them put their initials on the face of every one of those no cards. No way. I noticed your shirt there, because I'm a big Rangers fan. Oh, aren't we all now? We are now. <laughs> yeah. uh, tell me about your affiliation with the Rangers. You well, worked I worked for the Rangers, I think it was 2008, 2009. So you know, right was, before the World Series. Right before the World Series came around, and right at the same time that Nolan Ryan came aboard as okay. general manager. And one of the things that we uh, were able to do when he came aboard was have a meet and greet. And so I had a question for Nolan Ryan. What, what is the most famous pitcher in all time baseball other than yourself in your opinion? Any clues? Walter Johnson. Sandy Koufax. No argument there. And he would know. He knows pitching. Sandy, I mean, uh, Nolan would give away a uh, baseball to employees on their birthday and I was able to talk him into giving it to my son rather than me. Nice. I mean, yeah, you, you, you can't do better than to do something for somebody's children. Absolutely. Know? How cool is it that Ricky worked for the Rangers for a couple of years? Hearing his stories about his interactions with Nolan Ryan, etc. I'm a big Nolan Ryan fan. How can you not be? One of the things that I used to do when I worked for the Rangers was I'd get a ball out of the bat cages and I'd go up during the game and I'd, I'd find some kid uh, you know, wearing somebody's shirt, you know, and I'd give him the ball and I thought, man, wouldn't it be cool if I could say that this came from somebody? Yeah. And so I went to Josh Hamilton and I said, Josh, uh, I want to be able to tell these kids that this ball came from you. Is that okay? All he had to do is say, okay. He thought I meant, I need you to sign 81 balls. So I've got one for every home game. And he's, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do that. One day I was in the clubhouse and I was playing my harmonica and uh, Ian Kinsler was a fan of mine. And he gave me an autographed ball in front of somebody that I knew I couldn't keep it. So now I'm going up in the stands, I've got an autographed Ian Kinsler ball and I'm looking for somebody with the Ian Kinsler shirt on. And I look down and I see this little kid about six, seven years old, real short hair, big ears. He's got one of these $5.95 cent nylon mitt in his hand, he, he just punched in that glove, looking around like, man, this is the greatest place I've ever seen in my life. And I go, okay, there's my guy. I looked at his dad and said, hey, uh, can I talk to your son about baseball? 
They swung around, oh yeah, you wanna talk about baseball? Oh man, they were just so excited. This kid just couldn't wait to see what I was fixing to say. And I said, you know, Ian's getting ready to play down there. He couldn't come up into the stands, but he told me that if I found somebody that looked like a baseball player, that I should give him this ball. Are you a baseball player? And you'd think that he would be happy and think, oh, oh great, I'm fixing to get this baseball. But all of a sudden, this kid was just the saddest kid you've ever seen. He hung his head down and shook his head, rubbed his foot in the ground and said, no, but I will be in two weeks. <laughs> his dad told me he was joining a t-ball team in two weeks and he automatically disqualified himself from getting that ball. Of course, he was, he was happy to get it. And I'm sure he's a big Ranger fan today too. Absolutely. It's amazing what little things turn a, a kid into a fan, Absolutely. right? It doesn't take a lot. It takes a special moment. It takes a special interaction, something that just hooks them into the game, right? right. And then you're a fan forever. I was looking for a job and I applied for air conditioner uh, position and got hired. And uh, I was there, I think 2008, 2009. They did point out to me when I first got there that uh, there was a valve that they showed me that goes to the opposing team's air conditioning. Yeah, I turned it off once, okay? I turned it off once. Uh, and I got called down to the dugout to see what was wrong with the air conditioner. Of course, I knew what it was. And I got down there and it was uh, Vernon Wells, Vernon Wells what was talking to his teammate. And he was telling him, yeah, I went to school here in Arlington. I went to Bowie High School. I went to the ghetto school. I go, no, you didn't. He looked at me like, what are you talking about? He goes, yeah, I did. I go, no, you didn't. I mean, just as firm as I could be. And he said, yeah, I went to Bowie High School. I said, I went to Sam Houston. He said, oh, okay, you're right. In next week's episode, we uncover a spectacular collection. Inside that collection are these 1998-99 Skybox Premium Vats Jam Cards. These were super tough inserts falling at a rate of one in every 96 packs. They were also well-liked because they were printed on acetate and they were color matched to the jelly flavor of the card. We found four of these inserts in the collection, including the highly sought after Kobe Bryant. Which of these four do you think grades the highest from SGC? Go get it. Ronnie, stay. Ronnie, stay. Ronnie, stay. Ronnie, stay. One day, me and the dog Murphy uh, was trying to get a hold of my best friend. And I ended up going over to his house with Ron, with uh, Murphy, and his truck was there. His back door was open. I knocked. Nobody answered. I went through the house, and he was a big fan of my dogs, and I found him dead in his bedroom. And in his honor, I named her Ronnie. His name was Ron. Ron Smith. Ronnie, come. Good girl. Good girl. That's a good girl. So it looked like you collected late 50s, obviously into the 60s. When did you stop collecting? About 65. Okay. So Morgan, Rose, Clemente here, 65s. Uh, did you collect the whole set? Would you just kind of no, keep just cards? Hit miss, just, just hit, hit and miss? miss. Yeah. Okay. Now I've got another box over there of the uh, not necessarily great players. Okay. I saw Clemente, I saw Frank Robinson rookies, all kind of great stuff. But the thing that really caught my eye were those signed cards. I want to talk to you about these autograph cards. When I came in and the pictures you sent immediately, Hall of Fame autographs is my jam. And right. so seeing these is very, very cool. What's the story behind these? Well, the reason I can authenticate those signatures is because in 1979, 79, I sold a house to Rich Billings. He was the original catcher that came over from the Senators, original catcher for the Rangers. And he and I got to be friends. Uh, we, we formed a co-ed softball team together and we called ourselves the RBIs, Rich Billings Investments, because he was, he was investments. <laughs> yep, yep. So one day he calls me up and says, hey Rick, I've been invited to the old timers game. Do you have anything that you need signed? And I go, well, yeah. So I got these cards plus one other Willie Mays card and I gave him those cards and I waited till the next day I see which ones he got caught what got signed I call him a rich did you get any of those cards signed yep I go which ones he goes all of them and uh, the reason there's no second Willie Mays card there is because when I was uh, when my son was in Little League 
I had I was coach of his little league team, and we had a, I had a deal that whoever did the best I got it in the infield who just mo most pronounced I got it got that Willie Mays card. So he got all those signs. So I know they're all uh, authentic uh, signatures. Well, as a guy who looks at a lot of these, I can tell you those are totally all real. They're great. A lot of people did even like you're talking 1979, right? Back then, it was almost blasphemy, sacrilegious oh, to exactly. get a card signed, exactly. right? And, like, and of course, when I was thinking about the guy signing his card, his initials on his card, I thought, well, I wonder if I've, I've detracted from the value right. or not. So yeah. That used question. to be kind of the, the way things are, not anymore. Right. Uh, and it's because so few of them actually got signed while the players were alive. Banks, Robinson, and Aaron are, have passed away, so no more of these can get signed, right? And Mays right. isn't signing anymore. To have these is just super cool. I love it. And, and the story, the provenance behind it makes me like them even more, <laughs> uh, just to know that. So looking at all of Ricky's stuff, I'm really interested in pretty much everything. Uh, there's a lot of stuff there that's going to be able to fill sets for me that I'm building personally. And there's a lot of stuff that we can get graded and resell. So it's a great deal for us. So I'm excited to try to see if we can work out a deal. How much have you kept up with the card market in recent years? Uh, well, if you look on this card right here, you yeah. see that I've established a value, and that value was established somewhere in the late 60s. <laughs> wow. So that's how much I've kept up with them. You know, I, okay. after that, I just kind of put them away, and, and you know, I gave them to my son a uh, long time ago, and then I brought them back over here. Okay. Can I look at the binder? Do you Absolutely. Want? All right. These are all in pretty good shape, you know? Yeah. Um, doesn't look like you've messed with them a ton or Bobby Richardson. I don't see any Mickey Mantles. No, there's not any Mickeys. Why is that? I'm curious. Because I never couldn't talk that guy out of them. You know, I, I, they, they were hard to come by. But you didn't have any Mantles from when you were opening cards and stuff? I don't think so. Okay. When you look at raw cards, it's so hard to price because I don't know what they're, all of these would get graded. Right. All these cards on this table, we would grade. And so we have to pay to grade them. I can tell you what I think it'll grade. That doesn't mean I'm right. Right. And so you also, but you just, they're all raw. They're all just not graded, just raw meat, just not graded, ungraded cards. So you typically, you know, kind of look at, you can look at what they've sold for and stuff like that. There's ways to look that up. And we'll do that on a few of the key cards, but um, I can definitely tell you I'm, I'm interested in all of them, really, because I'm going back and building vintage sets and putting right. them in binders so I can look at all the cards and stuff. And I need these, like, you have all these 60, I have the whole 65 set, but you've got 67s, looks like some 66s. Uh, I mean, 63s all right here, 58, 59s. 57's there, so we've got a lot of great stuff. The stuff in the binder, but even some of these are common. Jimmy Pearsall's a common, you know, Claude Osteen's a common. Uh, even guys like Don Newcomb, kind of a semi-star, he might be three bucks. Right. You know, Aparicio's four or five dollars because he's a low, low-end kind of Hall of Famer. He's not Clemente, he's not Aaron, he's not Mays, right? So he's famous for having brothers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> But like all this, I need the whole six, I don't have any 63s, I have a few, but like all the 63s here are great stuff that I would love personally. So have you thought about, like it's weird, you got 63, but there's no 64s. And then you go to 65. Well, 66, 67. 64 was the year that I was in Guantanamo. And that makes sense. Baseball cards there. That totally makes sense. My team in 1963-64 was the Giants. Unfortunately, where I lived at in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, there was no television games. There were no radio games. The only way that I knew how Willie, and, uh, Willie McCovey hit was to wait for the newspaper to come out the next day. Let me ask you, are you, are you looking to sell everything? Like you want to sell well, all of it? Well, uh, you know, I had, I had 
given these cards to my son. So I asked him, what if we were to get a certain amount of money, you want to split it and go on vacation? So he said, yeah. So okay. yeah, we're, we're considering selling them. Okay. So looking through everything, I mean, the autos are obviously something I'm very interested in. Uh, everything, even with the stories, you still have to get them authenticated because that's where you, you really can add value to an auto. As much as I believe, Ricky, you know, some random person out there, if something happens, isn't going to know the story and then we have to grade all the regular cards you know so to me there's just god i want to say twenty five hundred three thousand dollars uh is kind of where i'm comfortable but that leaves us some room on some of the cards that we're going to resell and get graded and resell so we'll see how it goes because honestly most of your values and the stuff on the table there's some value in the binder too but we got to have some meat on the bone for us too so it's like, okay, if I buy it for a hundred and sell it for a hundred, what's the point of that, you know? And so you think, well, I'm gonna grade it also. And so I, I kind of get in that 60% range of what the value is. You know, it's time too. It's not, you know, right. we have to sort through them and grade them and sell them and ship them and all the things that, that go into the business part of it, sadly. Now, um, I'd, I'd give you two grand for all of it. I'll talk it over with him and see what he says. Okay. Can you call him? Uh, he's at work right now. He owns okay. a pool company. I, I work part-time for his pool company. Okay. So he's local he, here? He's local, but he's busy right now. Okay. Well, I know you're wanting to close, but I'm not really uh, prepared to do that until I talk to my son. I'm sitting here pretty disappointed, you know. I don't know if there's a number that I could have thrown out there that he would have said yes to. He was very close to the vest about what he was wanting for the cards. He wouldn't really give me a number at all of what he was thinking. So I just, I don't know where he's at. At the end of the day, not every deal works out and we wish it could, but you know, just kind of, kind of see where we go from here. So here's a lesson if you're the seller of a collection. You know, it's important to have at least some idea of what you want because most likely the person making an offer is gonna give an offer that, again, they're trying to get the cards as cheap as they can. And so if they come back with an offer, let's say you even let them go first, right? Well, I threw out a number first today and there was no counter, there was no you know, negotiation, so to speak. It was, here's what I'm willing to pay, and then crickets. So we'll see after he talks to his son, but I hope that we can still make a deal on these cards. I'd really like to get them. I think they're great, uh, but we, we can't get into a situation where we just overpay for something just because we think it's great. After the negotiation let down, Mike needed to clear his head. And the only way that felt right was to go stop into a card shop and see more cards. So here we are, play ball sports cards. Like I said, this is kind of the closest shop to me and it's 40 minutes away from my house. But when you need stuff, this is a great place to come. They've been in business for about 25 years doing sports cards. They've been in this location now for a number of years and this is where I'm used to coming. So let's go check it out. This is my childhood, right? I am trying to set the Pac-Man record. So tie whatever score I get, I challenge you to beat it. Oh, bummer. So the first thing you notice when you walk into this shop is how big it is. And there is memorabilia everywhere. If you're a memorabilia guy, this is your place. Christoph Porzingis, that didn't work out so well for the Mavericks. Little American League, Alex Rodriguez. Well, here's a blast from the past. Jim Sunberg. Jim Sunberg was a great catcher for the Rangers. I actually have a cool Jim Sunberg story. When I was a sophomore in high school, I made the varsity team as a catcher and I loved the Rangers. And, and my dad took me in the car. He said, come on, let's go. And he would get in the car and we drive over to Arlington and we pull up, knock on the door. Jim Sunberg answers the door. 
and he says, Mike, I heard that you made the varsity team. Come with me, go up into the attic and pick whatever you want. And I, so I go up into his attic and it's like candy land for catchers because there's gear everywhere, all brand new stuff that he had gotten and obtained over the years. And so I grabbed it, uh, a set of catcher's gear. And that was my first real set of catcher's gear. It was major league stuff. It was fantastic. So thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. So this card, Larry Doby, 1954 Bowman, is a card I need for my Hall of Fame run that I'm doing for basically every set from 1950 to 1989. In the lower half of the third frame, with two away and nobody on, Indian Doby rocket sings high, fast pitch for a trip to Mars. A lethal wallop more than 400 feet into the right field crowd. So Larry Doby was actually the first black player in the American League, and he came in not long after Jackie. Everybody thinks Jackie maybe played for a whole season or whatever as the only African-American player, but that's not true. Larry Doby came to the Indians shortly thereafter, Hall of Fame career, so he's pretty significant in baseball, and I love this card, so let's buy it. $59. I usually never pay sticker, but... I can ask my hold on this. All right, I'm gonna ask and see if I can get it even cheaper. Well, that was nice. Mike grabbed a vintage card, cleared his mind, and now it's just a matter of waiting it out on Ricky. Hey, Mike. How are you, Ricky? Good, yourself? Doing great, doing great. Last you were at was, um, you were gonna talk to your son, and you did that, obviously. How did that conversation go with him? Uh, he just left it up to me. Okay, okay. So, where are you at on it? Four grand. Four grand. So we are back at Ricky's house. We were here a couple of months ago and we're trying to just see if there's really a deal to be done, but I didn't want to do it by myself. So I brought somebody with me. Hey guys. Hey Ben. We're going to go look at this collection. You haven't seen it yet. It's a bunch of old cards, some autographs. So I'm excited. Maybe you can help talk some sense into me and help me figure out what a fair price is for all of this. So I'm excited you're here. So yeah, Ricky, I brought been here we're going to look through some stuff again i want to refamiliarize myself because i've slept a few times I understand. since we I looked understand. last time and so when you talk to your son since that's where we kind of left it what was his thoughts he just said it those, daddy those are your cards you do whatever you want okay remember those jelly cards we mentioned earlier we opened up our sgc mobile app to check our grades the Scotty Pippen and the Penny Hardaway both scored near mint sevens. The Damon Stoudemire graded out as an eight, and the most important Bats Jam card of the bunch, the Kobe Bryant, graded an eight as well. Now I'm hungry, so I'm headed to the kitchen to make a sandwich, and you're headed back to the show. Can you put yeah, Murphy in, in his room? Hey, Murphy. Hey, I'll just calm down. Mom. Murph, come on. Murphy. Come on, let's go over here. Come on, hey Elvis. Come on, Murph. Okay. I'm the dog whisperer. Come on, Murph. Come on. So I'm looking up sold like for a 67 maze. It just sold like for the 340. It's not PSA. PSA. It just sold for 340. 28. I mean, you can get to low three. This whole box. I don't do cons. Do you know what Tommins are worth? Uh, 50 cents each. Okay. I mean, it's 34, 3,500 is probably the value of it. That's for somebody that wants it, all of that. And you guys typically buy and resell, right? We do, that's why we can't, when I are gave you, you my number. all of it or just part of it? The whole thing. And the binder too, we didn't even talk about the binder. Yeah, basically when I look through these, I feel like there's about $2,000 of value right here on this lid. And then these, these aren't exactly on that level, but these are just really solid, great vintage. So there's probably another 650 in here. Um, put it up here. I think everything here is probably close to 3000. 
I don't collect commons, so there's not a ton of value in these for me, but some people that want to finish sets, this is great con great cards. I mean, I don't think it's quite up to 4,000. Do you have any room in that price? I mean, does it have to be at 4,000? Um, rather than talk about what we would do and what we wouldn't do, what would you pay for them? I'd pay 3,800 right now. You got a deal. All right. Really great to connect Ricky and Ben because I wanted, I thought these cards were really good and I thought if in the right hands, they would, they would fit into somebody's collection great. So I'm so glad that you were able to come to an agreement with, with Ricky and yeah, nice hat. Yeah, well, thank you. Nice hat. And for me, just hearing about the story and the connection and the meaning behind it, it just made it more interesting for me. Yeah. Glad we could do a deal. Chicken train, running all day. Chicken train, running all day. Chicken train running all day, you can't get on, I can't get off. Chicken train taking chickens away. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. If you really want to get a little crazy, go check out a few of our most popular episodes from earlier this year. Here are two that you might not have seen yet. Keep chasing.